okay, we're recording. Oh, thank you, man. Okay, so just um, a quick, just a quick update, a heads up before we pray. Yeah, well, when I go down to the to Tennessee, the they actually have a Bible study on Tuesday nights as well. So I, it's it's probably a good idea for me to obviously to attend that study, especially to get involved with the church and so on. So so I was gonna put this one off. Um, after tonight, finish chapter 20, hopefully, if we finish these questions. Um, so th there's a couple of options. One is I could also send all the sermons from Mark Chansky from chapter 20 to 28. I could send you the links to those on Sermon Audio so everybody can listen to those sermons because um, I got a lot of good information from him and it would it would just give you, there's a lot of good other stuff that he goes through in those remaining chapters that I'd hate to see anybody miss out on. Um, also, there's a possibility at some point um, we, I was talking to Rich Hammer about that. I don't know for sure, but we may be able to do something on, on Thursdays, like every other Thursday or something like that. If people are available, something to pray about it. If, if you all think about that and are available, maybe shoot um, Claire an email or shoot me an email or just shoot me one and let me know. Um, if, if obviously if, if everybody's got things to do on Thursday, it's not, it's a no brainer. We, we won't, I won't even do it. I won't think about it, but maybe like in every other Thursday thing to just work through the rest of, of Leviticus possibly. So that's a possibility we can think about. I'll send the sermons out anyway, though, as well. Um, but after tonight, I'm going to at least pause. <clears throat> Next week, I'm going to, I'm not going to do anything. I'm actually going to, going to um, do some moving. And then in the evening, I'm going to go out um, with a dear and beloved couple in the church. Um, we'll, we're going to go out to, uh, to dinner together. And then when I get there, um, you know, like I said, I'll go to that study. So this will be the last one for now. But let me know if everybody here can let me know your input. Shoot me an email about Thursday. If it's no good, just say it's no good. And then if that if 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 several people say hey they're available, um, we'll maybe we'll try something every other week or something like that until I get real settled in there, you know, and everything. And uh, we'll at least try to finish Leviticus. So um, anyway, that's the plan. But let's we'll go into the remainder of chapter twenty <clears throat> for tonight. Where we'll pray. We're up to question number three. <laughs> So we uh, will hopefully work through at least most of these questions. We we did trek through the, not bad though. Going through you know doing a study on tw the first twenty chapters of Leviticus, everyone here uh, can get it should get a trophy for that because it's it's a difficult book, and there's some people who will never even read the book of Leviticus. It, it, but it's a it's a good book, uh, and good to read. So let's uh, let's pray. Father, we do give you thanks for your mercy and grace to us. We thank you again for this study. We thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed us with it and just the, the ways in which we've been able to see Christ in this book and, um, and to work through these things together and the, the joy of fellowshipping with one another. We thank you for enabling us to have Zoom. And, and again, even seeing this as a product of what happened with COVID, which led to these studies, Father, we just we give you thanks for something good that came out of that. And we know there are many other things, but even this. And, and we pray for direction for the future, Father, if we should do something on Thursdays every other week, that that would be clear. And um, whatever your will is, Lord, we pray that we would do. And so we um, give it to you and pray now that you bless our time and as we continue through chapter 20. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go to chapter 20. <clears throat> and we are up to verses 7 and 8. We left off with question two. We finished last time um, with that. And then we'll go up to, let's get to 20 here. Uh, actually, we just were starting to get into question three a little bit. So let's let's do that. Let's look at question 20, uh, question number three again. again. Um, let's read verses seven through eight again. It says, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am, am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. So we did talk <clears throat> a little about a bit about this last time. Um, what, what comes up here, right? It's interesting, this insert here in the middle of this section with, with um, again, going through a list of things here uh, that the Lord addresses. And here we're dealing with the penalties for breaking laws. So even though there's some repetition here, uh, of specific laws that are addressed there's more details as far as the types of penalties and we talked about stoning uh burning with fire i think is one we're going to get to and talk about that and then also um how god also talks about cutting 
himself cutting someone off. <laughs> so, for example, the person who goes to sooth a soothsayer, right, right, or a, a psychic, um, it says the Lord would cut that individual off, indicating that generally people, when they go to a psychic, right, it's a private matter, uh, and yet God is saying, "Look, don't think that you because the, your people don't see you that I don't know, and God would deal with them." Uh, and in the context of having recently cut off uh, Nadab and Abihu, it would certainly be a fearful thing to even imagine that. <clears throat> and then the, those who are mediums or psychics and so on, uh, they would have been stoned to death. So that would be something that would be more publicly known. Uh, and so God would have had the people deal with them and put them to death. Um, but if the people failed to put to death an individual, as in the case of um, when we talked about the children being offered to Moloch, if, if um, the people didn't do their duty and put the person to death by stoning, they would, God would deal with them ultimately anyway. And it would be to the hurt of the people because they, they, they were supposed to ex execute judgment on individuals who had committed these kinds of offenses. <clears throat> so, so what are we taught in verses 7 through 8? I think, I think it's, uh, again, he's telling to, to be holy for he is holy. Um, keeping his statutes. He's the one who sanctifies us. But there's a holiness thing here that we are to be separated. You know, there were many nations there and they were to be separated from them. That was his law, you know, uh, keep my statutes and do them. He's the one who sanctifies them, you know, mm. sanctifies them. So again, consecrate yourselves and be holy. And that's uh, his command. Separate yeah. yourself. Be separate. Yeah, yeah where to be like be like God, right? In that sense, God separates his people and those who are his people are not to be like the other nations and to be like God, right? And he is holy. And, and, and so again, once, once again, we see when we think about God's law, these are things that have to do with his own character as well, right? Uh, especially the moral aspects of these laws, they, they come out of God's character himself. So when, again, when people tend to, some people would tend to think of the law as something that's separate from God, Right, that's distinct from God. Um, when you think of the Ten Commandments, right? Um, but really, they are they are they are those which which actually proceed out of the character of God Himself. Um, and so, those Ten Commandments even are an expression of God's character, which are centered upon loving God and loving neighbor. Right, the two greatest commands. Um, are the, the Ten Commandments hang on the two greatest commands of loving God and loving neighbor. But again, this is this is descriptive of the character of God. Law, the laws that God gives aren't just these outward things that God says, ah, this sounds good. Let me make this rule. They actually proceed from his own holy character. And so we're to be holy and to keep these laws because we're to be like God. Uh, and so it's important to see that, to make that connection between the law of God and God himself. <laughs> and even the ceremonial laws, <laughs> right, and the judicial laws, they proceed out of these laws as well in the sense of dealing with issues of separation, right? And um, there are ways of keeping... of of uh, teaching the people to be holy and separate through these different ways, through dietary laws uh, and et cetera, and, and other laws, not mixing seeds and things like that, so that they would learn the idea of separation. So even those laws are teaching them something about the character of God, um, even though the actual commands would be fulfilled in Christ in, in, in the case of the ceremonial laws. <laughs> um, so that would be why that's the case. What encouraging truth also is revealed in verse eight? <laughs> what else does God say in verse eight? Yet? <clears throat> that's, that's encouraging as well when you when you catch that yeah yeah kenny and lisa say yeah, yeah sanctification right um right what were we going to say mom the, the same thing that he he's the one who's <coughs> going to sanctify us thank yeah. god we don't do it ourselves because we fail miserably but he says yeah. i am the lord who sanctifies you thank you yeah. god you know thank we it's by his grace uh oh here comes dad you can say oh. something else? okay <laughs> Yeah, it's very, it's, it's a good thing to know that, right, that the love of God toward us is such that he, he doesn't only redeem us, right, from the penalty of our sins, but he also rescues from, rescues us from the, the, um, the effects of it, right, as well. It, it's a process, it's ongoing, and so there's an immediate redemption, but there's also an ongoing sanctification where God purifies us, and it's a, it's a process of suffering, right, and trial. But it's God is actually doing a good work through that. It's like surgery, right? Nobody enjoys surgery. My wife just had shoulder, shoulder, uh, shoulder surgery. And certainly the aftermath of that and having to go through therapy and everything to get back to getting a range of motion, all that stuff is not fun. But it, it was to fix the problem that she had with her shoulder. Uh, and so 
there's a blessing in that surgery, even though it brought pain, especially early on. And even though the therapy brings pain and even though it takes time to get back motion, there's a blessing in that, in that, in that work that's going on with the shoulder. Well, in the same way, God also, even though it's through pain, he sanctifies us. And so that's a very encouraging thing to see that, that God is not just saving us from the, the consequences or the penalty of our sin, but he's also making us holy. He's, he loves us so much. He's making us like himself. He's not leaving us there. Um, he's actually bringing us out of that condition. And when we get to heaven, we will be as Christ is. Uh, in fact, he, he says in verse, if somebody wants to read Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13, um, that, that's a good text that probably goes right in line with this. <clears throat> Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13 is a great new covenant text that conveys this. Paul? Yeah. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now, now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Amen. Yeah, so you have <clears throat> that encouragement there, um, right? It's, it's, it's the, when we think of salvation, we know that we're saved completely by the grace of God. It's nothing to do with our work. It's all of what Christ has done. It's his work. Uh, even the faith we have is a gift of God, but we believe, right? And it's completely God's work of grace. But in sanctification, um, right, we work, we, there's, a, there's a, a cooperative effort that takes place in our sanctification. And so without the work of God sanctifying us, right? We're without hope if we're left to ourselves. Um, and so God is the one who, who works in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Um, he's the one who, who um, sanctifies us, but at the same time, he calls us to work out our salvation as well. And so that there's a motive for us to do that. We certainly have a fear of God, but also because we know God is at work in us, we work, we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So we're involved with that process. We seek to put this to death um, the deeds of the body by the spirit, right? The deeds of the flesh by the spirit. Um, and so we, we, we have that, we have that encouragement, right? We would be very discouraged if we were on our own having to deal with uh, our sanctification, um, right? But when we know God is at work in us, we can see that work happening. And as we grow, we can look back and see, even if it's little growth spurts, we see how God works. <laughs> and so that's an encouragement with what God does, but we do that together with him. Um, um, so yeah, good, 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 uh, <clears throat> good answer there anybody else have any thoughts about that before we go to number four <clears throat> the idea of sanctification god being involved in that process um and that how how knowing god is involved in doing that and how he's the one who sanctifies us should compel us actually to cooperate with god in that process any, any other thoughts if not we'll go on okay well then let's go to number four so what uh, what verse, what is um, being addressed in verse nine? Uh, for everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. We've seen that phrase, by the way, as well. Anybody else, any, anybody have any thoughts about that? What sin is addressed there? <coughs> it's, it's breaking Bonnie, the commandment that you should honor your father and your mother. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that the days may be long. <laughs> so honoring mother and father, right, would be the very uh, the, the, the very opposite of cursing your father and mother. Right. Because uh, um, honoring them would be doing right, doing what they say and doing it with the right attitude and the right heart and wanting to be a blessing. Right. Cursing mother and father. Right. It's not uh, we're not talking about four letter words here. Right. This has to do with actual actually wishing harm upon them, wishing them, it'd be like the equivalent of saying to your mom or your dad, go to hell or, or something like that, right? It would be that kind of severity. It's actually wishing some kind of curse to be upon them and, or judgment to fall upon them. Uh, and so that's real se severe in the sight of God, right? To have that kind of an attitude toward someone, toward one's parents. <laughs> and we've seen as well um, that idea of his blood shall be upon him. In other words, there's no, when you think about this idea of your blood being upon you, in the context of Leviticus, right, this has to do with the idea of, um, of atonement, right? We know that when, when, when we're atoned for, when those animals atoned, they covered the sins of the people. God en enabled them to have a way of covering their sins so that they can go on. And of course, in Christ, we're forgiven for our sins. 
But when your blood is upon you, that means there is no atonement for you, right? It's your own blood that it's, it's required of you of your own blood. So this, this was such a severe warning. In essence, God is saying if somebody curses their mother and father, there is no atonement for them in, in this case, right? In Leviticus, that, that that's it. You know, you, you, they're to be put to death, you know, and they would be put to death for that. And that's what happens right later on um, with an individual in Leviticus, right? We have that example uh, of an individual who, who had, um, uh, actually, we had an individual who, 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 cursed his, who cursed God and is put to death. Um, but there was there there is it does talk about in scripture the idea of cursing parents. I'm thinking about cursing um, God in that sense, but blaspheming God in, in that sense. But but yeah, that that's a serious offense in the sight of God, right? Cursing one's parents um, was was a very serious offense. Yeah, <coughs> the fifth commandment, uh, Rich Hammer put put across. Yeah, the the idea of honoring mother and father that your days may be long on the earth, right? That's the first commandment with a promise. So. <laughs> real important. Um, and so they would be in that case, um, what was the punishment for committing such a sin? Right. We, we saw that, um, his curse, uh, he would be put to death, right? So that they would be, you would probably stoned by the people. Imagine your own parents, right. Being involved with that, with that process of stoning your own children. Now that this isn't talking about little, little, little kids in that sense, but still it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a son or a daughter who's in rebellion, right. As they get into their teen years perhaps, uh, and they cursed their parents, they were actually be brought before the elders and they would be put to death for that. Uh, that was a real serious offense. <clears throat> Good. Um, let's look at Exodus 21, 15. <clears throat> these, are, these are two texts that have to do with, with this, what we just read in this particular command. Exodus 21, verse 15. says, and he who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death, right? So there's another example in this case of dishonoring your parents. It's not cursing them in this case, but the idea is somebody who hits, right? And that's happened before. I know I know of examples in my own history of, of uh, a friend who, who's, uh, who's had brothers who hit their parents, things like that, you know, so you can see that, the severity of that, of striking your mother or your father. And then Deuteronomy 21, somebody read Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 to 21. Okay, good. If a man, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him, will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city and at the gate of the place where he lives. And they shall say to the elders of the city, this is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Wow. That, yeah. That's a frightening thing to think about, right? Imagine that that must be the most hardest thing to imagine. Doing that to your own, you know, your own child. But. But that was this, that was again the the um, the importance of putting God first, right? Remember, with in the case of Eli, not that he was, you know, he had, he he didn't really effectively discipline his children even properly, but his two sons, God wound up wound up having them cut off in war in the war with the Philistines. But but you can see that that's the severity there, right? Here's a son who was kind of a deadbeat, <clears throat> becomes a glutton, right, and a drunkard, has no respect for his parents. Um, and they, they dare to bring him to the elders of the city and, and to have him stoned to death. It must have been a painful reality. But again, we see here the importance of putting God before even our own family, right? You see that example here, um, how we're to value the holiness of God. And it says here, right? You shall put away the evil from among you and all Israel shall hear and fear. Boy, that would put fear into me if, if, I, if I saw that happen to, to somebody's children, you know, something like that. Um, that. That's a frightening thing to imagine, but that's, we, God is to be first, right? Above, above our children, above our relatives. Yeah, Pop. Yeah, I was going to. I wanted to say that um, it's uh, interesting. Uh, interestingly enough, the um, uh, in uh, and on some other cultures, this kind of thing uh, comes from the from ancient history. You can see it. It kind of came through. Certain things were passed through, even from the beginning. Uh, 
And you can see even like in some Asian nations, Japanese and so on, where they have honor, they may not have a lot of other things, but they got honor for their parents. And they don't want to do or say anything that's going to dishonor the, the name or their, their parents. Um, and, and the other side of the coin is that um, if you remember, of course, like uh, World War II, the beginnings of uh, when Hitler came into power, um, that whole brainwashing stuff that started really kids. in the kid with kids, that the children were even even willing to turn their parents in to the Nazis if they disagreed with what you know what Hitler said or what the Nazis or what the government said. They literally turned in their uh, people and their families and um, and their uh, parents. And so today, to take it to today. You know, this brainwashing stuff that's going on, even from kindergarten all the way up in the schools, a lot of different subjects, right? Um, you know, there are things that obviously their parents would disagree to, and they're being taught, in a sense, brainwashed to do the oh. opposite what, or, or to react <laughs> in another way, uh, which is dishonoring to their parents. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cut. Yeah, they're, they're not only they're being taught to dishonor their parents, they're being told too, right? That they, um, they're they being enabled to do things apart from their parents' knowledge, such as getting abortions or, or they'll be provided with condoms, or even if they want to get a, a uh, if they want to change their sex, right? They're, 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 they're able to do that without their parents' permission. All this stuff that they're allowing, they're, that they're uh, trying to allow kids to do to, to separate them from the authority of their parents is, is uh, you see that, you know, how severe that is and what they're being taught. <clears throat> and so, yeah, it's, it's a shame that they, but you see that in the scripture, scripture has a high view of the family, right? A very high view of the family. It always has all, in both Testaments, you know, the, the importance of the family structure and the father and the mother and the authority of the father there and the mother um, and the work that they do in their children and society, you know, when a culture is going, it's going the wrong way and in trouble when they start to try to break down the family, which is what they're doing um, in, in, in our society today. Very, very serious. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Anybody else have any thoughts on that, on cursing mother or father before we go into the next um, question? Okay. Well, let's read verses 10 to 21. Could somebody read 10 to 21 of Leviticus 20? <clears throat> this will sound familiar to what we did last time, except there's, there's a little difference here, obviously. What? Somebody read 10 to 20. Yes. Lisa or I can? Sure. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If a man lies with his father's wife, he has uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall, sh shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. If a man lies with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have committed perversion, their blood is upon them. If a man lies with the male as with the woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. If a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire that there may be no depravity among you. If a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and lies with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death, their blood is upon them. If a man takes his sister or daughter of his father or a daughter of his mother and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace, and they shall be cut off in the sight of the children of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness, and he shall bear his iniquity. If a man lies with a woman during her menstrual period and uncovers her nakedness, he has made naked her fountain, and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from among their people. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister or of your father's sister, for that is to make naked one's relative. They shall bear their iniquity. 
If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is impurity. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. <clears throat> okay, so this, this lengthy section was, it parallels um, in what, what we've gone into chapter 19, I believe it is where it talks about the, the different aspects of uncovering the nakedness of different relatives and so on. But um, so what, what sins are, we, are addressed here? All the sexual sins. Yeah, all the sexual sins of, of all kinds, right? Whether it's having to do with um, within, within, you know, within, the, um, the, uh, within your family, right? Um, even extended family to some extent. Um, and then also even with, with uh, bestiality, right? Dealing with animals, incest, I was trying to think of. Um, and then also <clears throat> even with, uh, yeah, of course, adultery. And then with the, with, um, and then having to do with the woman in her state of uncleanness, right? During her so monthly cycle. <clears throat> so you have all these different things here um, that are listed here, all, all having to do with different kinds of sexual sin. Um, what are what are the judge? What kind of judgments are do we have we seen listed here throughout this section? There there are a few different kinds that are here, what, and, and you do see that their blood being upon them again listed here as well. Um, you see that repeated right in these texts. Verse eleven, their blood shall be upon them. Twelve, their blood shall be upon them. Thirteen, their blood again. <clears throat> all that that language. Uh, Sixteen, blood shall be upon them. <laughs> all that language is the, the idea when God says your blood will be upon you. <clears throat> The idea is that there is no atonement, right? They're going to have to, it's going to have to come out of their blood, right? They're going to, the shedding of the blood is, is the means that God ex extracts for the payment of sin. And in this case, there is no atonement for these individuals, right? Um, at that time. So <clears throat> let, let's, um, yeah, homosexuality also is listed. That's right, Rich. Rich that's right. Homosexuality is also here as well. So what, what kinds of, um, what kinds of judgments to hear? We have, right, the verse nine. Uh, is cursing the father. I'm sorry, the man alive. What, what kind of judgments are here? Death. <laughs> okay, putting death right. We we see uh, there, there is actually an, an it, it's interesting too um, that when it says in verse 14, if a man marries a woman and her mother, <clears throat> it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, <clears throat> that there may be no wickedness among you. Um, if a man lies with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, him and the animal. It's believed that when it talks about the, the here, we, we talked about stoning, right? We talked about being cut off. <clears throat> this concept of being burned by fire now, um, it's the understanding here is not that the individuals were burned alive. Usually they were stoned to death or put to death first. But as a former, I mean, but as an additional means of, of pronouncing a curse in these particular cases, they actually burn the bodies with fire afterwards. Um, and so there's this additional form of judgment to indicate in a sense, really to point to, to the, as a, as a um, picture to the people to give them a sense of their curse um, and a picture of hell in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, and so one of the things that's <clears throat> interesting when, when you think about the idea of being burned by fire in scripture, um, when, when somebody was, was burned by fire after death, when they took the body and burned it alive, or when they left the body unburied and let the animals eat it alive, those those were, those were means of showing individuals as cursed. Um, that's one of the reasons why I, why I wouldn't. I'm not saying that I, I wouldn't condemn anyone for this, but one of the reasons why I don't believe cremation is is a viable means um, of burial uh, in in scripture. I don't think it's a good thing. Is because every time you see it done in scripture, it's always done in the negative sense. Uh, it's always either it's it's either a practice of the heathen or and when it's in the case of the people of God, it's it's exercising some form of judgment uh, or it's indicating some form of judgment. Um, and so just to note that here in this text, when you see that idea of being burned by fire, um, that was something that the Jews would never have done to their dead. Um, it was always they were always buried. Right. Uh, anything else would have been a form of judgment. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church, if you remember right, when they burned people alive. But remember in the case, I think it was of, uh, of John Wycliffe, because John Wycliffe died before they had a chance to put him to death. Ultimately, they, he survived, he lived. 
later on, because of the, the alleged trouble that he caused in helping to lead to the Reformation, they actually exhumed his bones. They dug him up from his, his bones up and burned his bones as, a, as an expression of judgment on John Wycliffe. So just, just to say historically and biblically that that's, that's a reality. So I'm just noting that just, I, I know that there's many people done that, even many Christians who have done that, but just to share that with you, my own, my own understanding of that, when you think about the idea of burning with fire, um, my recommendation to everybody here, if possible, um, is be buried, you know, uh, is, is the proper way to, if we can. Uh, and if this, if it's a financial issue, you know, maybe the church can help whatever it is. It doesn't mean that because somebody has been cremated that they're in hell. I'm not saying that at all. I know good Christians who have been, but I'm just saying, I think it's ideally when we look at the examples of scripture, um, burial is the proper method of, of dealing with those who die. Yeah, Bosco? Yeah, it, it seems like whenever missionaries um, <coughs> historically visited and affected indigenous people, they stop the pagan practice of cremation and started to bury. Um, one of the, the first thing that changes is that they, they see the value that the body is also made by God and, and the body is good. And so instead of, again, burning their bodies, uh, they started to find places to bury them to, to, to show the dignity of the image of God. So that, that kind of effect seems to kind of permeate um, the culture of, of uh, when the gospel goes forth. So uh, it, it just seems like there's a, a different understanding of, of how the soul and the body is good and that you know, what, what they've been doing is very pagan and uh, un, un, unbiblical. Yeah. Yeah, it's also, it's also a means of, it's, in a sense, it's a testimony to the fact that we're looking to the resurrection, right, of the dead. In the end, we know God is going to resurrect the body. Now, it doesn't mean because somebody was burnt, they're not going to be resurrected because people die in wars. People die from, you know, from hand grenades and who are Christians, right? So it's not to say that God doesn't bring them together, but when when we when it's within our power, obviously it's it's the it's the right thing, the biblical thing to do would be to to be properly buried as an expression even of our anticipation of the resurrection. Um, now recognizing, like I said, I'm not I, I would I wouldn't condemn anyone who's done that. We just were at a funeral where somebody had was cremated, you know. So it's not I would I would not go to the funeral or anything like that. But just to share with you my personal conviction, when I look at scripture, there's never a time in scripture where burning of an individual is looked at in a positive sense ever, whether it's before or after death. Um, it's always, and you look at the opposite, when you look at the people of God, it was always, they, you look at Abraham, right? He went and he had to invest in a, a piece of land, the cave of, uh, by Machpelah, right? He bought, he bought that, that piece of property so that he could bury his dead. That was always the accepted means of dealing with those who were your, your, um, your kin, um, when you buried them, you buried them, you know, you buried them, you know, even when, when they were on journey, when, um, with, um, Jacob and, um, Rachel, when Rachel died, right. They were on, they were on, they were in their travels and he couldn't keep her until he got back to, to, um, where they buried their dead. So he actually buried her near, near, um, uh, near Bethlehem. Uh, but he buried her, right. He didn't cremate her. And, and, and that could be the easy thing to do, right. To, to make ashes. It's, it's certainly a lot cheaper today in our day and age. But again, I don't want to turn this into the whole thing about cremation, but I did want you to know, at least in this text, that idea of being burned with fire was, was an expression of a severe form of judgment. And in this case, it was after the individuals were put to death for this kind of sin, this idea of this, this kind of incest, um, there was an additional expression of judgment by burning their bodies after they were dead. So I just want to highlight that. I don't want to beat the horse any more further than that. Um, anybody certain can add to that if you have any comments or even if you disagree, that's fine. You can, you can say that. Um, I'm not going to chew you out or anything like that, but, but it is something that at least I hope that I, I think it's worth mentioning. Um, worth mentioning. Yeah. Mom or pop. Yeah. Mark. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when I, when we first read this and hear this and uh, about the penalty for these things, uh, all the sexual crimes amongst them, um, and it's, it almost, for me, when I first hear it, it seems a little harsh. Uh, it seems, uh, wow, you know, it's, it's stunning, you know, uh, people, you know, the penalty for these things. But that being said, um, it's given me a more of a pre, an appreciation for Jesus Christ. Because we know that God is holy and he ain't kidding around. He's holy, righteous, and just. 
And um, there's no doubt about it. And we can see that even through these kinds of uh, reaction and penalties for, for these sins. But let's face it, all the more God, I have an appreciation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here we have a God who's never done anything wrong. Everything is perfect. He is God. And here he is, um, come, you know, comes to earth according to the scriptures. And then he dies and takes the penalty uh, for sin for us. Now, there's real tremendous, tremendous, no matter what about the holiness of God, there is a look at the great love of God mm. that Jesus would die in our place. And although those, those penalties there seem to be harsh, death, et cetera, burning, et cetera, what Jesus went through on the cross was far worse than even those penalties mm. because he, died, he uh, not only suffered on the cross and all the physical aspects of it, uh, but also God poured out his, his wrath on his own son. The depth of that is, is, is mind boggling. Yeah. So what we can appreciate when I hear this in Leviticus, all the more my mind goes to an, a, a, a better appreciation of our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 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 And when you look at the Lord, at God in these judgments, it's quick. It's easy to say, as you said, it's easy to say, well, look at, look, that, that seems so harsh, but in reality, that's, that's, that's a revelation of the, of the holiness and character of God. That's a revelation of how offensive sin is to him. And he's a good and righteous God. That We're getting a picture of what true righteousness and holiness and goodness are. And so when we look at that and we say that seems harsh, that's because we, we, we are so far, far from that kind of purity and goodness um, of God when we think that way. We don't realize, you know, the extent of God's holiness. And so <laughs> these are expressions of, of God's holiness and it's good it's righteous it's what's just and so these kinds of things are that kind of an abomination to to god um <clears throat> which brings me to another thing in fact my mom went, threw this at me last time um i don't know if we, uh, when you were here mom i think you did or on the phone or something <clears throat> but another thing that's here as well um that just to mention for a moment since we brought up i brought up the cremation thing is um you know the issue of of sexual intercourse even with your own spouse um, during a menstrual period, I know that it's kind of awkward to bring this up, but when I look at it in this text and I look at some of the other texts we've talked about, I don't think God's happy with that, <laughs> you know, you know, um, with that, with that. I don't think that's just an old covenant thing either, where God is saying, well, you know, that's just an old covenant thing. I think there's a moral issue there when you look at how it's worded here. Um, if a man lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, he has exposed her flow and she hasn't, and he hasn't, she hasn't covered the flow of her blood both of them shall be cut off for their people. <laughs> so <clears throat> somebody who was, remember, being cut off in this case was something God would do, because who would know that? Who's going to know that that happened, right? Just a man and the woman and his wife. <laughs> um, and so this is even between a man and his wife. Um, again, I'm not saying that today that if somebody did that as a Christian, that it's the unpardonable sin. I'm not saying that, but I would say that um, it, I, I don't think it's something that honors God, that there's something about that, the idea of the blood being involved with that and what happens with that that is serious in God's sight so just just a side note with that when I look at we, we've seen this in the past too in two or three other texts where this was mentioned um <laughs> and it bears at least mentioning and thinking about because it's easy to say ah well that was the old covenant you know um and to throw these things in the old covenant this is in the midst of a section that deals with bestiality incest homosexuality you know and then thrown into this package is the issue of being involved intimately with someone during their menstrual period, um, I can't separate this out and say, "Well, that's just a, that's just a ceremonial thing." Um, personally, I, I I don't see it. Um, but anyway, that just something to throw at you as well from from the text. <coughs> also, <coughs> anybody else have any thoughts on those those kinds of things? Uh, if you want, if not, we can go on. But I, I they're not comfortable to talk about. But um, I feel like I have to at least the. Uh, at least I've gotten, I've gotten, I, I'm, I'm a faithful watchman as a pastor. And I've, and I've said what I had to say about those two issues, um, you know, that, that I, that I don't normally, you won't hear me preach about those generally from the pulpit probably, or at least, at least this particular issue. Um, <clears throat> all right. So <clears throat> going on, um, we see the different kinds of judgments, right? God cutting off. We talked about stoning, being burned by fire, 
Um, and then here, <coughs> we notice that a lot of the things we've gone over already in this chapter and just this section that we just read, or uh, there's, a, there's a repetition from the last chapter, but what's the critical difference between this chapter and the last one? What, what are we dealing with here? Um, why, why are these reiterated here? What, what's the difference in this chapter where we have these things mentioned and the last chapter where these things are mentioned? What's the critical difference here? Or I should say the critical addition. <coughs> what do you notice? Is there just an echo of chapter 20 with chapter 19 and God is just repeating himself? Or is there something that's, that's also here that kind of follows well with 19, even though it's mentioning the same things? Um, we, we've talked about this a little bit already, but I wanted to see if you thought about that at all. What, what is it that we see here? What kind of law are we dealing with here? Remember, we talked about the three categories of law, right? There's, there's um, moral law, and there are moral principles that are really traced out into all kinds of law. We talked about ceremonial law and then judicial law, right? And um, so in this case, what are we dealing with? Uh, the difference between this and chapter 19, right, is in chapter 19, we're dealing with moral law, uh, moral and there is some ceremonial there and moral law. But in chapter 20, we're dealing more with the judicial law, right? The judicial aspects of this, the, this is actually a revealing of the kinds of judgments or consequences that were to be given be, uh, uh, because of the breaking of these when these laws were broken. So you notice in chapter 19, it talks about all these kinds of sins. A man will not lay with his, you know, with his mother-in-law or with his sister or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but you don't have the actual judgments listed in 19. It's just a revealing of the actual laws, the prescriptive revealing. Here we have the actual judgments that would be put upon them if they violated these laws. So there's a little bit of a difference in the sense that we're seeing some more of the judicial aspects uh, of what the people were to do when these kinds of violations took place. So that's the primary difference. Here. Um Okay, so what is included in this chapter is that the, is, uh, the judicial aspects. <clears throat> All right, let's look at verses 22 to 24 then. Verses 22. Somebody read verses 22 to 24. And feel free always, uh, if you ever want to jump back, if a thought comes to mind about something we've already read or anything like that, you have a question or a comment, don't ever think you can't go back. I always I try to reiterate that, but, but we'll go on anyway at this point. So verses 22 to 24. Yeah, Lisa or Ken, question or reading? Yes, you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them, that the lands where I am bringing you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nation that I am driving out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I detested them. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord, your God, who has separated you from the peoples. Okay, so what's reiterated in this section here, after we've gone through, remember we went through that large list of sexual sins. Um, just prior to that, the Lord, we had that insertion of, uh, you know, I'm the Lord who's holy and who sanctifies you. And then we had other sins that were listed before that, child sacrifice, etc. But here we have, again, another, another additional comment, some comments that are given here. So what... What's reiterated here, and what is the purpose of this warning? Well, you, you go, you, first of all, God's given you this land that's already occupied by people that you got to get out of there. Don't, don't get their customs, because they've done all these sins in the past. So he's going to put them out. This is, he's give, this is his land. It's God's land. So people say, hey, well, how, that's not fair. They put them out. This is God's land. They disobeyed what he had put there, you know, the people there. So don't take their customs now. You're going to inherit this land. It's going to be yours, a land flowing with Lincoln, uh, milk and honey. He's going to be your God in that land. He's separate. Again, we got that separation uh, going on again, separate holiness. So you're going to be separate and clean. You know, you're going to have the, the beast again. You got the beast, the clean, the unclean beast, and uh, the clean bird, the unclean bird. But he's going to give them the land. He's going to give them this land. You're going to be holy and separated from the nations that are there. <laughs> Goodbye, Jack. That's it. They're out. You're in. But don't take their customs. Don't take their sinful ways. And you're the Lord's. He's, you know, you are his. You are God's people. He's given this to you. So praise, praise him for that. You know, be holy yeah. just like he is holy. <laughs> yeah. There's the, there is that emphasis, right, on separation, on holiness, on distinction, 
Um, God is shepherding the people. The, the, the land is vomited out. The other people will vomit out the other people in the land, the heathens. And we talked about that because of the abominations they committed, indicating again that God's law was applicable to those heathen nations, right? His law was not just for the Jews. His moral law was universal in its scope. And the proof of that is that the land is going to vomit out these foreign nations because of these kinds of abominations. So we know that that moral law existed beforehand, even though it's given, it's codified and given to Moses and the people in a written and, and an oral form. It's written in the heart of man, as it says in Romans as well. So there is that emphasis on distinction, on, on holiness, right? That's why they called Israel, right? The, 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 the land, the holy land, right? Um, Jerusalem, the holy city, right? Where the holy temple is, right? So there's that holy, that word holy is constantly reiterated to remind them that this is what God has set apart out of all the world, which all belongs to God. But God is separating a, a particular place and a particular people for himself where he's going to put his name, right? The whole world belongs to God, but he's putting his name with these people because the world is fallen. The world is, 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 con is condemned. And so he separates them through Abraham, separates the people, divides the nations, and he picks and has one part of the land that he uses for himself. And that land is to represent him and be holy and to be an example to the rest of the world uh, until Christ comes, right? And then brings the gospel to the whole world again, where, where God, Christ, that's why when we get to the New Testament, when we see, and also in the Old Testament prophecies, we see that God will give the nations. Remember, he talks about he's going to give the nations and the end of the earth. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations and the ends of the earth is your inheritance. Who does God give to Jesus, right? What land does he give to him? He doesn't give him what he gave to simply the King David, right? Or to King Solomon. He doesn't just give them the borders of Israel. He says, ask me and I'll give you the nations. Jesus gets the whole world. That's really what belongs to God. But at this point, God is setting apart just this land and hallowing these people until Christ comes to make the atonement for, for all nations so that he'll bring a people to himself and he will rule the, the entire world, right? Which is what should be. So there is that separation here, though, for the, for the nations. Very important. <clears throat> and that's where verses 25 and 26 Right, all of a sudden you think, well, where's this coming for, from? If you look at verses 25 and 26, if somebody can read those. Um, in fact, read 25 to 27. Somebody can read 25 to the end. <clears throat> we'll see the relevance of why God brings this up again here. Paul? Okay. You shall therefore distinguish <laughs> between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make yourselves abominable, abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I am the Lord, and for I the Lord am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. A man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death, they shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Okay, so in verses 25 and 26 in particular, right, we see the relevance of uh, in this within the context of what we just read. Um, what what is the um, what's the significance of the Lord now all of a sudden going back to mentioning about the clean and unclean animals, right? What what does this tell us again about the ultimate purpose? of there being a distinction between clean and unclean animals. Animals, we've talked about this before, why God does this. It's not just it's not just because there's something wrong with these animals. There's a reason why God had them separate these particular animals. What's that? What's the purpose when we see in this context, what is God doing with that? <clears throat> what is he using this distinction of clean and unclean with animals for? What, what is the main purpose of it? Is it for sacrifice? Well, he's going to sacrifice, but even for the ones that they eat, let's say. Why, oh. why, why is God telling them they, have to, they, they can't eat certain ones? Like here, he really reiterates, you, you know, eat unclean and clean. You just really said it before, Mom, right? And the verses right before that. What, what, what's the primary reason why God separated these different animals for eating purposes? The Jews couldn't eat certain animals, but they could eat others. What was the main thing he was doing with that? Separating them from the nations that are there. Separate, yeah. Being separate. From the people who live there now, you know, who they're going to put yeah. out. Yeah, it's not that he's saying, hey, you know what? I don't want my people ever to taste the, the, the wonderful taste of bacon, right? Uh, <laughs> it really comes down to this idea of separating them from the nations. God used even the dietary laws 
right, as an as an, another means of separating his people. And remember, when they went into captivity, right, <clears throat> one of the things that helped the Jews maintain some level of separation when they went into the Babylonian captivity outside of their land, so they didn't just assimilate, right, just just combine with all the Gentiles, um, was through these dietary laws. We see that example, right, with Daniel. Remember when Daniel and his friends, um, the king had all this, you know, <laughs> good, great food they could have eaten. Um, and they were not to eat food from Gentiles, right, and drink the wine and all that. And so Daniel and his friends would rather eat vegetables and just drink water, right, and, and maintain their purity before God than to enjoy these kinds of uh, liberalities that the heathen nations had enjoyed because they maintained their separation. <clears throat> and, and God used that to preserve his people, a lot of his people, not some compromise and so on, but to preserve his people <clears throat> while they were <clears throat> even in exile. It was another means of, 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 of fostering this separation. And obviously when Christ came uh, and undid that, right, when, when the gospel was to go to all nations, that wall was broken down, right? And so we, the, the idea of eating unclean or clean animals, there is no clean or unclean. What God sanctifies, right, don't let anybody call unclean. Uh, so this would be ceremonial, Mark? Would this then be ceremonial? <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the clean and the unclean, yeah. The, the ceremonial. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The, the right. moral principle there, right? The ceremonial is, is the, the, the actual eating of the clean and unclean the animals. The moral principle would be the principle of separation, right? Um, and even in the new covenant, there's a principle of separation from the things that are unholy. Remember what it says when, when um, Paul refers back to the idea of coming out from among them, being separated from the nations. In other words, not partaking in their sins, right? Their actual sins, right? That the people in our, right, in our culture, and our world are comfortable with. We're not to separate from the people with the use of these animals anymore uh, as, a, as an additional help. We don't need that. Um, but we ought to be separate from them by not partaking in, in the fruits of wickedness. So that principle is here with the animals. But God uses the external aspect of the animals as well to also help, to help foster that separation until Christ comes, right? While, while, the, while his people are still in, you know, in, still in grammar school, so to speak, or still in school, so to speak, until with the tutor, until they've matured. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, excellent. Yeah, very good. Anybody else have any thoughts <clears throat> on that, uh, that, on verses 23 to 24, before we go into question number seven? Okay. <clears throat> Let's welcome Charles Mills. I'll, I, don't think, I don't see a microphone up, but Charles, if you hear us, <clears throat> I'm glad you're able to join us. Charles visited us recently from Texas, um, and just welcome you, brother. <clears throat> okay, question number seven. When we consider how God dealt with these types of sins in the Old Covenant, um, and we've talked about this before, but it, it bears repeating, um, especially because of the nature of Leviticus, um, what should these things teach us about God? So when we look at these things, what do these things have to say to us? Um, there, there are a lot of things. And we'll get into the gospel aspect of that in question nine. So, so hold off on the, the gospel aspect of this. But what should these things teach us when we look at this? And we've touched on this already. But what, what, what should they teach us about God? <coughs> what, what relevance the, for us? The Paul? ultra holiness of God. Yeah. <coughs> the pure, there's a sense of purity and um, um, his own personal type of, of righteousness. But... Um, you get the sense of just um, real purity uh, and holiness, that separateness on his yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, these are, these, are real, these are real descriptive pictures that help us give, get, gain a good understanding of the holiness of God, <laughs> right? God tells us that he's holy, and he gives us a lot of didactic teaching to show that, right? Very clear teaching where he says it. But these kinds of, when we think of these kinds of judgments, um, and what happens uh, as a result of these sins, these consequences, it gives us also a pictorial reference, right, to the nature of God's holiness, even as the cross does, right? Um, we, we tend to be able to operate good when we have, when our senses are addressed in different ways. So in one sense, there's the direct teaching, but then there are these graphic pictures God gives us, Nadab and Abayu, what to do when somebody is, uh, commits incest or adultery or, or some type of child sacrifice. We get a real sense of the holiness of God and what he's about, even by the judgments that he brings forth, um, right, on different nations. Remember when he sends the Israelites to kill in, uh, in Jericho, for example, and God doesn't just say kill the men. <laughs> he says, can the men kill the women and the children, 
right? They would have killed the children and the infants. All the people would have been wiped out. And there was a picture there uh, of the severity of God's holiness against sin. Um, you know, we can't imagine that, but but the, the reality of, of, of killing infants and so on, right? That doesn't, it doesn't digest in our minds well because we don't have an appreciation for the holiness of God. But when they wiped out those nations, they would have wiped out every single fragrance of those nations, including their offspring. Um, and so it, it really gives you a sense of appreciation, a pictorial illustration of God's holiness <laughs> when we see that. Um, and so how ought this to affect our view of sin in the new covenant <clears throat> um, in the civil community, in the church, in the family, in our personal lives? How ought these things to, to affect our view of sin in the new covenant? <clears throat> so, so often people are, are try to divorce the old covenant completely from the new or the Old Testament from the New Testament. And they treat the new covenant as if God has changed in some way, as if these truths are not universal truths about God, or as if because Christ offered himself that we can be lax um, in, th in, in these kinds of issues dealing with morality. Um, what do we, what should these things teach us about dealing with sin um, in, with respect to uh, the new covenant <laughs> uh, from a civil standpoint with our government? In the church, family, personalized, etc. What, what should they teach us? You could address that either in a universal sense, or you can address it in any one of those individual areas that I mentioned. But what do you guys think about that as far as thinking about the nature of sin? <coughs> yeah, Pop, go ahead. Yeah, it, 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 it makes me realize the helplessness of us. When I think of sin and the depth of sin, and not only these sins mentioned here specifically, but even, uh, you know, had Christ in the New Testament, how he showed them even the depth, of, you know, beyond that, the depth of sin. If you hate your brother in God's view, it's like murder. Uh, if you uh, lust after a woman, it's like, adultery. you know, it's like adultery uh, and so on. So when you look at it from, from the way it's, really is that uh, sin all the more all the more we realize our helplessness and how we need the savior we need help we can't we can't make it we're all sinners you know and we all uh we all uh you know we're going to be punished unless we have christ so all the more we need christ um so we're in a we're in a bad situation but that's what okay. the law is it shows us <laughs> our the need and the help, well, our helplessness, and how we need that mercy of God and that grace of God, we we, we rely on that because nobody could do this themselves. Nobody could keep the law. Let's put it that way, a hundred percent. And we can see God's judgment in all of this. So from yeah, from the standpoint of of our standing before God, right, and being able to to um, to enter into the presence of God. Right. When we look at these things, it certainly would show us that we would be helpless um, apart from the gospel. Right. No question about that. That's that's exactly right. What about from the standpoint from from having been made right with God and standing under the cross? How should we view these kinds of, uh, of things yeah, from a sanctification standpoint or from a standpoint of knowing that we're never condemned for these things? We, we're in Christ. But how should we then still view these sins? in that state what a debt we owe and we can't pay we are so indebted to god who, who forgave us these atrocities you know god hates sin he hates it and yet he took this upon himself something he hates and abhors took upon himself we 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 need to be just bowed and humbled and like wow you know what he did for me, what he forgave me for, uh, makes me say we, we need to be forgiving to others who have done something against us as well. The forgiveness is beyond what we could ever think, the forgiveness. It's just, um, how could you forgive me, God? Not, not why did he do this to me, but you know, how could you forgive me? You know, like people always say, you know, why did God let this happen to me, something bad? And I says, why didn't he let more happen to me? considering the sin that we've committed against, you know, against him, you're, you're humbled. There's such a humility there that he forgave, you know, this ugliness, this horrible things that he hates. Okay. So from an attitude standpoint, certainly there should be humility. There should be giving of thanks. There should be giving of praise, those kinds of things as well. 
What else, Paul? Yeah, I, I, to me, it's like from week to week, we've always been sharing this, but the it's the um, the epitome of just how great grace from under Christ really is. We get to see the dichotomy between the God of the Old Testament <coughs> and the New, and if God has never changed, if it wasn't for Christ, everything we're reading in this chapter, we would be deserving of as far as punishment. It's almost inconceivable. Um, in fact, when we see the laws that were, um, we've come up through the earlier chapters of all the detail that God would require of us, we're in a society that we, could, I, we couldn't handle it. If, if it was required of us and we didn't have the blood of Jesus, if we had to even do half of it, I, I don't see myself being able to fulfill it. Some of the sins are repulsive to all of us, but others, others are not, right? Everybody has that propensity for sin. But um, right, as, as your dad said, uh, and, and Dale mentioned as well, we, we just could never, we could never attain to it. So it really illustrates just what was accomplished. That much more is exemplified in, in Jesus on the cross. And I think many Christians today miss the boat because the God of the New Testament is all loving, right? I came out of a church where the love was so embracing that it, accom it, it, it accommodated um, uh, everyone to the point of almost um, um, not measuring up to um, God's standard uh, because a, a love, you know, it's a, the scripture does say love covers a multitude of sins, but it, it negates the fact of that we're called to even higher purity uh, in a way, because when John said that what Jesus exposed our hearts, what we think in our hearts is as, is as detrimental as committing the sin. Jesus said, as John said, lust in your heart, hate in your heart, hate's murder, lust is committing the act as far as Jesus was concerned. We're even called to a higher grace and that's how it should impact us. Um, and we're incapable of keeping that, if not physically, at least mentally in our hearts. So we really need the power of the Holy Spirit um, to, to accomplish this. But that great dichotomy of what uh, a God who never changed and the death sentence in the Old Testament and being under grace in the new is really exemplified by doing this kind of a study. <laughs> Good, good, Paul. Okay. <clears throat> and so right now we're hovering in the area of <clears throat> one response should be recognizing, right, with respect to our standing before God, we, we know that we'd have no hope. So, we, so we, we're, we're, we, we, we're desperately in need of his grace. We see that when we look at Leviticus. Also, the, the attitude that we have of giving of thanks, of acknowledging how much dependence we have on, on, on Christ and the gospel. <laughs> But I'm also trying to get to one more thing here, <clears throat> one, one other main thing here about what our attitude should be towards sin, because those things are 100 percent true that we're saying. But what tends to happen is, is we can allow those truths to take us to another extreme right? where we almost see it as well. <clears throat> we're thankful <clears throat> that God has rescued us from this penalty of sin, that he's dealt with it in Christ so that we know we're no longer accountable to the law as a means of being right with God. And we could see that as a means of almost living in a, a life of defeat. Like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm going to be dealing with sin in my life, but Christ paid for it anyway. And what use do I have anyway? Because I can't win because sin's greater than me. Is the Christian to live a life of, of seeing that their, their ability to overcome sin in any sense as impossible when they are in Christ, when they are saved, when they're justified by grace going forward? Are they to live a life of saying, well, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm just thankful that I'm saved by grace and I don't, I, um, I can't beat sin anyway, so I can kind of just wait till I get to just kind of chill out till I get to heaven, right? That, that's never the attitude, right? Um, when we understand these things about God, right, also it should lead us to, to have an attitude that would say we want to, we are determined to defeat and conquer sin. We should hate sin as God hates sin, right? Yes. We, we, there should be an active element in our hearts where we're not willing to say, you know what? We're saved. We don't have, we, we could never fulfill the law perfectly. So let's just forget about it anyway. And we'll just lean on the blood of Christ in that sense. In other words, that would be, that would be too far to the other extreme. There should be a militant sense where we're saying, 
that we're determined by the grace of God to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to put sin to death. We're in a battle here against sin. And even though we're not justified by our works, we're called to work out the salvation. And out of love for Christ and love for God, we are taking aim at our sin, right? Um, and it has to be by grace. But again, we're to, so that, that was the thing I was saying. I was saying we need that when we think about um, our view of sin in the new covenant should be such that our God hates this sin. It cost him his son to shame the, the, um, the abuse, the beating and the put to being put to death, the execution of his son to pay for it. I am determined in my life by God's grace to put this to death that lies in me by the spirit. Right. Um, and that's what it means to be led by the spirit. <clears throat> I was reading a devotional. Somebody gave to me recently <clears throat> um, in the church. It was talking about the spirit, you know, the work of the spirit. And I was so disappointed on one of the pages because it talked about what it meant to be led by the spirit. And it said, well, <clears throat> it was a small little devotional. <clears throat> Uh, it was in one of the booklets there in the back of the church. <clears throat> and it said, well, best one, let, let me give an illustration of what led by the spirit is. When I was younger and when I met the woman who would be my wife, um, God told me inside of me that that would, when, as I was there with her for the first time, that this would be my wife. Uh, and that's how, and, and he used that illustration and, and other things like that to say that's what it meant to be led by the spirit. That has absolutely nothing to do with being led by the spirit at all. Zero, nothing. Um, being led by the Spirit has to do with the Spirit's use of his, of God of the Word of God in our lives to lead us to overcome sin, to lead us to obedience. And so, as we read the Word and we're praying in the Word and we're listening to the Word preached and we're studying the Word together in, in Bible studies and fellowshipping, the Spirit of God will bring that Word to our hearts, so that we now, as we are, as we ha we're tempted, we have the ability to be led by the spirit and to oppose the desires of the flesh because of the work of the spirit in us by that word. That's what it is to be led by the spirit. You know, you, it's not just this, it's not this feeling of God saying, well, you should get married to this person or you should move or do this or that. I'm not saying God doesn't lead or ever give us those kinds of indications in certain ways. Of course, we need to get counsel, right? When we do make those decisions, but that's not what being led by spirits. I just want to read one text with you in Romans eight. Um, because I think it's important. It's really important for us to have a balanced view of understanding that um, that we are never justified by the keeping of the law or by dealing with sin. But at the same time, in, in sanctification, we have a sobering responsibility to be at war with our sin and never to say, well, and I've heard that even in Bible studies in the past from somebody in the men's study, Paul, who you would know from the past. I, I don't want to mention the name. They're not a member of the church who used to say, well, you know, it, it, I can't do any of it anyway. The Spirit of God has to get rid of that sin in me. No, the Spirit of God does do that, but we cooperate with the Spirit of God in that work. Um, so if somebody can read Romans 8, verses 1 through, <coughs> through um, well, let's say 1 through 14. Um, there's so much more we can really read in, you know, the other chapters before this and everything. But Romans 8, 1 through 14, just want to read that <coughs> before we go on to the next question. <coughs> Oh, here it goes. I have it if you want. Here too. Good. Yeah, uh, Romans 8, 1 through 14. Myself? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. There, there is therefore now no condemnation <coughs> to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Uh, in the likeness of uh, sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be, be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carn carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. 
if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are sons of God. For Ma'am. you did not, just, okay, up to 14. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I mean, it really, there's a lot more even before this. So that just, just you, you see there, and it, it, when Paul's going through this in Romans, which there's obviously a lot of depth to what he's saying in, in these chapters, six, seven, eight, and so on. But what he's saying here, he, he has both of these things being brought together. He's dealt with justification, right? Um, in the first six chapters, So we know that Paul is not a small proponent of justification by faith alone. He's emphasized that we cannot be justified by the keeping of the law. We cannot be justified by works. Jew and Gentile can only be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how Abraham was saved. It's through the faith of Abraham, right, that we're saved. Same faith. So that we know that. But when he gets into chapter 6, 7, and (laughs) 8, he starts to work his way into sanctification because he says that people are going to ask the question, okay, well, if, if, if grace, if we're saved by grace... And God is glorified by, um, by giving us this grace and forgiving us and showing us the greatness of his grace. Then why not sin so grace can abound? Why don't we sin more so that we can all the more emphasize God's grace? And that's when Paul says, well, not, may it never be, or God forbid, right? How can we who have died to sin live any longer to it? And he gets into what, we, what we're going into here in chapter 8. And so <clears throat> there's both of those truths which are brought up here today that are important. We're justified only by grace and only by Christ alone. And so we're encouraged, as we said, when we look at Leviticus, if we knew that this is what was necessary for us to have a right standing before God, even for a day, we would all be doomed because we could never climb that hill. We would all be damned um, to hell. Also, the idea of being gratefulness, the connection with being grateful to God and thankful and humble comes into play because that's what leads us then as we're justified by grace. It leads us to the place where we we say that we desire now to obey God, not out of seeking to merit his favor, but because of out of love for God, because of his love for us, the spirits put the love of God in us. We now want to deal with sin and put it to death. And we in fact have the power to put sin to death because of the spirit. So it doesn't mean that we're going to be sinless on this side of heaven, but it does mean that we are going to be putting sin to death and growing, right? And sometimes that growth can be slower than other times, but there should be a progression in our sanctification. Uh, and that's why you have <laughs> Brother Bosco put in the chat um, different verses, and you can see both of those elements in there, right? Romans 7, 24 and 25. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Right? Paul knows, right? When I want to do good, I don't do the things that I should do or that are good. So you see that battle in the Christian mind. We still have that battle, but I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Uh, And so there is that sense of we we know that because of Christ, we're justified. That doesn't change. And then verses 8, 13 and 14, I won't read again. But what Paul said, just read, living according to the flesh, you will die. Right. But if we put to death the deeds of the body by the spirit, right, we'll live. Uh, And that if we have the spirit of God, we will be led by the spirit. Um, First John 4, 4, you are of God, little children, and I've overcome them because he was in you is greater than he was in the world. And then first John 5, 4 and 5. (laughs) For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? (laughs) So it's just an encouragement to us (laughs) to have that proper balance where we're never looking at our works or how at our sanctification and seeing that as a determination for whether or not we're justified in God's sight or how well we are in God's, how well we stand before God, because even our best deeds, right, are contaminated. But at the same time, there should be this fighting against sin, this warring against sin, and this desire to put to death the deeds of the body. Uh, And as we see Leviticus, that kind of hunger should be in us. Um, In the civil community, right, there should be a desire to to keep sin in check. Um, No, we're not going to have the same judicial laws uh, in place that were for Israel, 
We're not necessarily going to stone people who commit adultery and so on. We, we, we can have grace, but there is a good place for restraint in law, and there is a good place even for the death penalty, right, in, in law. Um, in the church, we exercise church discipline, right? <laughs> Um, if people are, if we're if people are living in sin in the church and there's no repentance, somebody is 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 a drunkard or is committing a, an adulterous uh, adulterous acts and there's no repentance, there's no change, there's no confession and repentance. We have to exercise discipline and we need to put them out of the church, right? As a, as a, a means of giving them over to Satan, we excommunicate uh, and so on. So there is disciplinary acts within the church that we exercise to keep the church pure. Uh, in the family, right? What we do in our homes, um, how we seek to maintain purity within our families and under our roof uh, in our homes and what we do. And even when we're dealing with unsaved children, right? When they're under our roof, we still need to work on um, on curbing uh, what they do and, and keeping rules in the house that would be in keeping with the will of God. And of course, in our personal lives, we have to work on, um, as Paul says, beating the body as it were, right? He buffets his own body so that he puts it in subjection. Even the Apostle Paul, right, his own body wanted, his own flesh wanted to still do those things that were sinful. Paul still had a struggle with covetousness, right, and lust. They were there that he had to wrestle with. And so he had to buffet his body in that sense, as it were, and bring it into subjection um, to Christ. We have to, we have to do that with ourselves to deal with our own sin as well. <clears throat> so that was just the main thing I was trying to get across when you read this. These chapters in Leviticus in this section, we see that. <clears throat> um, we're just about out of time here. Just real quick, maybe we'll just quickly look at eight and nine <laughs> very quickly. Um, what is a balanced view of how we ought to utilize the civil ju judicial laws for today? <clears throat> just to give you a, um, a real quick sense of you have these two views that are somewhat extreme, uh, depending on how far you go with them. There are those who are in the dispensational camp who would say that um, that the, the, the old covenant of the Old Testament has absolutely no relevance for us today. Right. So they would say, don't carry any of that over into the civil government or any of that. Uh, it's irrelevant. And they don't see the the they don't see that God's nature is unchanging and that there is a connection still between both covenants. Um, God has not changed. And there is a line of connection that connects both covenants. And we need to be able to, to deal with that and work through that. And so we know we need to, to separate things that are ceremonial. And, you know, kind of pull out the, 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 the seeds out of the grapes, the pits out of those grape, those grapes that have pits in them and still take the juice that is still for today, the moral principles. Um, the other extreme would be, and I hate to even use the word theonomy because theonomy is actually a good word, um, but extreme theonomy or extreme reconstructionism would say that we need to reincorporate all of the laws of Leviticus uh, and the Old Testament today. So when I say extreme, I mean like every single judicial law should be in the same to the same extent of that it was then. Um, and some of them would even say that the dietary laws should still be in place today. Um, so that's the other extreme. Uh, there's a healthy balance that we have to have where we stand, where we say, no, um, these things are not to be on a on a one-to-one -one basis on how we how we apply these things today that we're learning from. Some of them are the moral the moral view or laws are universal, but even the even the, the ceremonial and the judicial laws still should have application today and still should have principle today and still should be useful in some ways today, even in how we run our government and so on. But we need to kind of measure that out and pray through that and make sure that we're properly appropriating that without, without, creating, without seeing ourselves as the same as the theocratic nation of Israel. Uh, and that takes work to wrestle through that. Um, there's a balance there, though, in how we do that, how we need to apply those things. Um, and so that's the challenge. <clears throat> um, anybody, any, any last thoughts on that? Um, question nine, we've discussed a little bit already, but any last thoughts on that, just on that balance and just what we learned from Leviticus? I think we've been trying to fairly have a fair way of applying these things. And, the, and I think we can discern as we read through them, you know, which... Um, which things we can take in their fullness as moral and which things we need to kind of extract the moral principles from and, and kind of be careful on how far we go with it. Um, again, not, you know, mixing cloths or not eating pork and those kinds of things. We see the principles that are there with not blending with the nations or, or the sins of the nations, but we're able to eat those foods today. Obviously that's where we would separate the pit from the, the, the juice that that's uh, 
you know, that's profitable to us. Any, any last thoughts on that question eight? <clears throat> I'll throw that in. And then question nine, we've discussed as well, where does the gospel come into this picture? How ought the cross to come in the light of all that we've gone over? Some of that was talked about by what my dad said, mom, Paul, what you guys said already. But any last thoughts about question eight um, or uh, the balance of these things or question nine, how the gospel comes in before we close, um, we close out. <clears throat> anybody have any last thoughts no okay i mean we, we we've we've kind of gone through it already certainly we see them i think that the key is the un recognize the difference between justification and sanctification um in these things that as we look at these laws it's it's exactly what was said you know we're 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 thankful for the grace of God that's been given to us in Christ. We recognize that we cannot meet these, these demands, um, that we fall far short outwardly and especially inwardly, even as Christians, we struggle uh, and that we need God's grace. And that at the same time, we have to battle against sin. So what we talk about and thankfulness that we have in all these things for the gospel of Christ, um, that in all, if we don't see our desperate need of Christ and the gospel, when we read through Leviticus and we don't see him pictured there, throughout then we've missed really everything that is in the most important things of this study um because even our obedience comes out of that right it comes out of the gospel everything we do comes out of the gospel it's not it's not divorced it's not compartmentalized we don't say okay well the gospel is over here but then we need to obey and that's over here our obedience proceeds out of the gospel as well uh it's a response to the gospel it's the work of the spirit in us that's descriptive of the individual who has been saved by the gospel so we can't separate these things. They're really connected. Um, any final, final things before we pray? <clears throat> okay. Anyway, I hope this has been profitable to us. Like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send an email out to you all with the, I'll, I'll send out the sermon links in there for Mark Chansky so that you can listen to them if you want to, and also respond to that email. I'll put in, I'll remind you, to tell me what you think about the possibility of doing an every other Thursday thing when I get to Tennessee. Um, if you're able to do that, if you want to do that. And again, not everybody will probably be able to do that, but if we get even a handful of people or enough that we can do a little study and you guys want to do that, we'll do that. Um, so just, I'll send that to you to remind you and then just give me a response as to what you, what you all think about that. And I'll also send you the sermon links so that you can use those uh, as you'd like to anyway. Um, Bosco? Brother, I just want to say thank you for bringing us through this light book. Oh, it's a blessing. Thank yes. you, brother. Appreciate yeah. it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. thank you, Pastor Mark. Thank you. A pleasure. Really been a pleasure for me. I've enjoyed it myself as well. The recording. Oh, yes. Let's record. Let's stop the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Vinny. Thanks to Ruth. Right, we got to listen to the woman's voice.